We see in verse 20, they said, come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these pits. And say a ferocious animal devoured him. You see down in verse 21, Reuben said, or verse 22, don't shed any blood. Throw him into this pit here in the desert. And we see down in verse 24 that they threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. I want to preach what's going to sound real strange. I want to preach this morning as the Spirit shall God with this thought in our minds. I don't have a problem with the pit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have a problem with the pit. I started this sermon off by asking or posing a question. When was the last time you entered or endured, rather, a hardship, challenge, pain, or season that in your mind was unfair and undeserved? We can understand when we fall into something as a result of our own actions because when discipline is connected to wrongdoing, then no matter how much we don't like it, we can understand it because there is punishment when you have done wrong. But what about when you don't deserve it and you haven't done anything to fall into it? And can we just have a, a moment of honesty and transparency this morning? As we get older, one of the surprises of life is that there is really no real correlation between the amount of wrongs we commit and the amount of pain that we suffer. As a matter of fact, many times we discover that it's just the opposite. That is, we do right and still get knocked down. H have you ever been there? Where, where you're doing the right things and still get knocked into suffering. I imagine that had to go through the mind of Joseph when things got rough for him as they did in this text. Let me suggest a few things for your consideration. One is that oftentimes, listen, God will allow certain seasons of suffering because it is the suffering where God makes us into who it is he would have us to be. May I also deposit and posit for your hearing and consideration that every now and then the suffering is God's way of showing you off. Y'all didn't like that one right there. Uh, that sometimes God shows you off for his glory because he trusts your maturity enough to know that he can put you in a season of struggle that you don't understand and yet in the midst of your lack of understanding, you'll still give him the glory. Oh my God, I, I, I wish I had some mature folk who could touch your neighbor real quick and tell them, don't feel sorry for me. No, no, say it like you really mean it. Tell them, don't feel sorry for what I'm going through. Now, look back at them with a whole lot of arrogance and tell them, you might want to wish you were me. Because maybe you aren't going through anything because God can't trust you to handle this situation. So maybe you ought to wish you were me because I'm in what I'm in as a confidence booster from God and a compliment that he can trust me with a tragedy. I'm in what I'm in because this is God's way of showing me off for his glory. Mm. When, when we read the story of Joseph, we, we, we celebrate a whole lot of things in this, in this story. We celebrate the awarding of the robe because it becomes the sign of the favor of the father on his life. But then we shake our heads in disgust when we see how his own brothers treated him. Because for many of us, it reminds us of a chilling factor. That the ones you should be able to trust with your heart become the very one to tear your heart apart. Ah, oh God. How many of y'all can testify? Ain't no drama like family drama. <laughs> Sometimes the trouble you get in is when you trust your heart to people that you ought to be able to trust it to. That's a whole nother sermon. We, we, we even try to identify with the pain Joseph must have felt when he was thrown in that pit. 
But let me say this to you today. You really don't know what it's like to have a dream until you are placed in an environment where there is nobody there that is with you. Uh-oh. A dreamer can testify, watch this, that once you have a dream and speak that dream, it can become one of the loneliest experiences you will ever encounter. It can get frustrating because the people who you thought would support you suddenly press the mute button. It can become frustrating when you have a dream but you're surrounded by people who speak against it because they are caught up on the facts while your spirit is caught up in the faith. And you're trying to figure out how this dream is going to come to pass and then in the middle of trying to work your dream you find yourself in a pit. And this is going to be a mind-blowing sermon. I don't know how many amens I'm going to get. But here's what the Lord showed. Thank, thank you for that one I just got. You should not have a problem with the pits of life. <laughs> I want to suggest this morning, probably very differently than you've heard this text, that we should not feel sorry for Joseph being thrown in the pit. Being in the pit is not a bad thing. I know this sounds real crazy to y'all. I, I, I think Joseph may have appreciated his time in the pit. Because sometimes it's not until you've been through something that you can look back on what you went through and say, you know what? It's when I went through what I went through that helped to make me who I am today. Do I have about 19 of y'all who can say I'm thankful for what I went through because it helped me to put my life into, I wish I had a few of y'all who could look back over some things you thought were going to kill you and should have killed you but only served to make you stronger. It made you a better man, it made you a better woman, it made you a better spouse, it made you a better person, it made you a better friend, it made you a better Christian. Christian. And here, here is how you have to reason pits of life. This pit was nowhere in the dream God showed Joseph. So if God is allowing something into my life, that wasn't in the dream for my life. There's got to be a reason why he's allowing me to go through this. Let me just, let me just give you a few principles you can write down, you know, tweet it, Facebook it, whatever you do. Sometimes, here, here are the reasons why your pit stops. That was kind of cute, wasn't it? Why your pit stops are meaningful. You ready? He's thrown in this pit in the dark by himself. Because sometimes it's in silence where I come to my senses. This is going to be a rough sermon. Um, this is going to sound crazy because by, by nature we like to take the role of the victim. Who, who did what to me? Who messed over me? But, but let, me, let me build my case. Y'all stick with me. Build my case, then give you my conclusion. Joseph's got mad favor on his life. He's the youngest son born to Jacob and yet gets the first mention in the chronology. In the reverse order that it should be in. The one who shouldn't get noticed is the one that gets noticed. Somebody say favor. Favor, F fa favor is when you shouldn't be in the place you are in, but God places you Oh my God. Um, favor is when you shouldn't be the one people gravitate to on paper, but for some reason you just keep sticking out on your job. The, the father then gives Joseph a coat to symbolize his love. Church say favor. favor. 
uh, he gets a blessing he should not yet be in line for. Now, when God gives you favor, it becomes equally as important that you know how to be responsible with the favor God's given you. Y'all ain't liking this one. Uh -huh. See, we like to run around shouting about, I got favor, I got favor. But it is equally vital that you know how to be responsible and manage properly the favor God puts on your life. I'm going somewhere. Because if you read this story, Joseph does not carry favor well. Okay. I know I'm going a whole different direction with y'all. Um, in the midst of all this favor, God shows Joseph a sneak peek into his future. He's going to be a leader. Now, now you got to know how to read the first few verses of chapter 37 to really understand this thing. Joseph is given this coat as the expression of the favor of the father. His brothers can't handle the favor because they feel that he doesn't deserve it according to culture and custom. They are haters. Watch me now. I'm going somewhere. Joseph did what you should never do with haters. He responded. That was so simple you missed it. His trouble didn't get started because he had haters. His trouble didn't get started because folk didn't like him. His trouble got started because he gave them so much power that he had to respond to them. This is a rough word in here this morning. So watch what happens. Watch what happens. He responds. He, he knows they don't like him. So his response to their dislike of him is to try to get them in trouble with the father. Y'all must be don't read the whole story. The story says in the first few chapters, verses chapter 37, that he goes to his daddy and gives his daddy a bad report of them. He's like a brat who knows his brothers don't like him. So his response to them not liking him is to try to get them in trouble. I promise you I'm, go, I'm, I'm going somewhere. And then as if that ain't enough, he then goes and tells the brothers whom he knows already have an issue with him. He tells them about the dream he has where they going to serve him. I'm going somewhere. He knows they don't like him. He knows they hating on him. And he goes to the very ones hating on him and tells them, y'all are going to be subservient to me.